Okay, good job on section one, and here we are in section two for about another 30 minutes. Okay, uh, here's a word we need to know the definition of for the exam. It's jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction is we can notarize anywhere within the physical boundaries of New York. Okay, so here's a map of New York, and you've got all the way down to the end of Long Island, up to the Canadian border. Okay, anywhere in New York State is our jurisdiction. So no matter what county your stamp says for the address, you'll be assigned to that county locally, but you can go notarize anywhere within the boundaries of New York State. That's your jurisdiction. We can notarize instruments, which are anything in writing. Anything in writing that's been written or typed that somebody asks you to sign and get notarized becomes an instrument, a legal instrument, because once it's going to be notarized, it becomes recordable and admissible in a court of law, as you know. So anytime they say the word instruments in the law or on the exam, they're talking about anything to be notarized. So we can notarize instruments or anything from any other jurisdiction outside New York, including other states and foreign countries except the three things we're not allowed to witness or notarize. There's actually three things we're not allowed to notarize. I'll just mention them here. We're going to have a slide on it. The first thing we're not allowed to notarize, if somebody brings us a contract of marriage, in other words, if they ask us to marry them, we must refuse. In New York State, unlike other states where the notaries can marry people, in New York we cannot notarize a contract of marriage. The second thing we're not allowed to do in New York State that notaries in other states can do is we cannot notarize somebody's signature to their own will. And the logic behind that is that a person who's going to have their will recorded or admissible in a court of law without further proof, in other words notarized, should have legal counseling prior to their document being notarized rendering it recordable. In New York State, to get your will notarized, it must be a lawyer who gets a notary license and then therefore notarizes it. As we learned before, while lawyers, or also known as attorneys and counselor at law, do not choose to become notaries. However, they are all qualified, they're all pre-qualified by virtue of the fact that they carry a lawyer or attorney's license. That would act in lieu of their pass slip required for everybody else. And that's the same rule with court clerks, just a little review there. So we cannot notarize people's signatures to their own will unless we happen to be an attorney who is also licensed as a lawyer. The third thing we are not allowed to do is we're not allowed to notarize the photocopy of any government document and make it into a certified original. There are certificate words that says the notary is making the document into a certified original. In that case, the notary wasn't witnessing somebody. The notary is just making the document, which is a government photocopy, a government document photocopy, like a dri driver's license photocopy, or more commonly that you're going to see wherever you work in New York State, people will bring you their birth certificate photocopies or their passport photocopies and ask them to be notarized. We are allowed to notarize them by having the person sign a statement on the photocopy that says it's a copy and, and therefore we could make it into an affidavit. But what we cannot do is make it into a certified original. And we're going to see uh, examples of that later on. Okay. Conflict of interest. Most people are familiar with this term. It means if you're going to be the notary to make the document recordable and admissible, that you shouldn't be too close to the contents of the document personally, or you shouldn't obviously be the person signing it because you wouldn't want to testify in an argument in court if you were one of the parties because that would make you a bad witness. You'd have a conflict of interest. If we are a party of interest, a party of interest, we have legal consideration or a conflict of interest. 
which is anything of value to us, including money, services, and love and affection. Okay, first let's go on to what it means where you work, and then we'll come back and break all this down. However, so this means it's an exception, officers, employees, and even stockholders of a corporation can all notarize each other's signatures as long as they are not pecuniarily involved. Now, that word pecuniarily probably isn't in your vocabulary. Most people never heard of that word. It means that you have a conflict of interest because uh, you're involved in the document where you work personally as a company representative. Therefore, you're pecuniarily involved. And think about it like this. If your name was in the document, for example, you're the notary at the office and you're notarizing the president of the corporation's signature on a bonus agreement with you. Well, you're pecuniarily involved. And I like to remember the word this way. It sounds like the word peculiar. Wouldn't it be peculiar for you to have to go testify in court if an argument ensued over your bonus agreement with you and your boss? So you would be the plaintiff, the person bringing a lawsuit against your boss who didn't keep his word, who would be the defendant, and then you would be called to be the witness for the state. Well, they would throw the document out because you were pecuniarily involved. You can't jump from the witness seat to the plaintiff seat. That would be very peculiar, wouldn't it? I hope that makes a little sense to you. So this is when you're at work because everybody at work is either an officer or an employee or even a stockholder or shareholder of a corporation. And if you work in a government agency, you're working in a corporation. Most people don't know it, but all government agencies are actually individual corporations. So this applies to everybody where they work, except for people that work in a small family business that hasn't been formed as a corporation yet. Okay? Now outside of work, that's this part. This is the general rule, and then down here is the exception for where you're at work. So out of work, in general, if we are a party of interest, in other words, conflict of interest, we have legal consideration, which is anything, don't forget that word anything, of value to us, including, I call these the big three, money, services, and love and affection. Okay, so let's break this down with some examples. Um, and a lady that took one of my Manhattan seminars uh, laughed when I said this, that you can't have money, services, or love and affection. She said, well, that means I probably sh can't notarize for my husband. That's what you're saying, right? Because of, of love and affection in marriage. And I said, that's correct. However, the law never states, and they will never ask you on the exam, can you notarize for your spouse? It never says you can't. As a matter of fact, the only one that it says in the law that they can ask on the exam is, is that you cannot notarize for yourself. That would be very peculiar, wouldn't it? To be the witness and be yourself in a document. But anyway, it never says you can't notarize with love and affection for your spouse. The law never says you can't notarize for your mother. And I hope most of you love your mother. Um, the only one it specifies is that you cannot notarize for yourself. And that's the only one that it will actually ask you on the exam. If you can notarize for yourself. And of course the answer is no. Okay, so she said, well... And this is this is makes the point why they won't ask that. She says, Well, what if I don't love my husband anymore? Can I notarize for him then? And the whole class laughed. And um, I said, Well, um, unfortunately I have experience uh, in New York State with marriage without love and affection. I'm not now, I'm happily married. Um, however, uh, a long time ago I did, and I, I told her, you know, I'm pretty sure if there's no love and affection in marriage in New York legally, then it, it's going to become about money. It's about money if you don't have love and affection in marriage, and I think the divorce rate's like 70% now in New York. So it always becomes money, a legal issue, if there's no love and affection, so you would still have a conflict of interest. And she said, without hesitating, what if I don't love him because he's broke? And the class burst out laughing. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure that if you don't love him because he's broke, there's no services being performed, so we can't use that. Uh, I'm pretty sure if you don't love somebody because of a money issue, you're an anything person. Uh, for example, 
Have you ever met somebody who holds on to revenge? Somebody who's angry and unforgiving? That's an anything person. People like that can value anger. They can value revenge. Okay? So in that case, an anything person might want to use their position as a state officer to accuse a person or set that person up for, com for uh, committing perjury. You see my point? So anything can be anything. Now I'm going to go to the real world, not the exam world, to help explain this a little better. A notary public can be called into court to testify anytime somebody signs a document and is witnessed by the state office of the notary. It will never work. The judge will throw the case out for conflict of interest anytime the notary is pecuniarily involved. In other words, their name is in it as the company or even themselves agreeing with the company in something. Or if it's outside of their work environment, if they have any, any conflict of interest, including money, services, and love and affection. That will be challenged if this document, this notary act, comes into question in an argument in court, which of course we call litigation. What you want to be familiar with for the exam are these is, is this paragraph, the general definition of a conflict of interest, and you do have a copy of the notary license law and you're going to be doing the exam over and over with this in it so you'll be familiar with it. The beauty of a multiple choice exam is you never have to memorize things, you only have to recognize them and you'll recognize this by the exam day be able to pull it out of uh, multiple choice questions. This word I would focus on for what you can't do at work, you can't do the peculiar one sounds like the word peculiar, you can't be peculiarly involved, I hope that helps just so you know, the exam is going to be number two lead pencil exams. So bring number two lead pencils with you. Um, it does say that in the frequently asked questions. They usually have it at the exam, but sometimes they don't, and they don't have to have it there. So make sure you bring a couple number two lead pencils to you to the exam. Okay, conflict of interest continued. If we get caught with legal consideration, which is a conflict of interest as a notary or are pecuniarily involved in the document, the document will be an unacceptable defect. Okay, let's go over this term, unacceptable defect. An unacceptable defect is where a notary did something wrong to the point where the document is unrecordable, or if it was already filed and they found out that the notary committed that wrongful act afterwards, the document would then be unrecorded excuse me, as we learned before, um, a document can be unrecorded when it's done illegally. So an unacceptable defect in this case was because they found out after the notary notarized it that the notary was either had legal consideration or was pecuniarily involved and the document became unrecordable. Then the notary can be charged with professional misconduct. You see a pattern here which is a class A misdemeanor which we learned is mandatory sentencing up to one year maximum. Then of course the notary public's license could be suspended or removed once they've had a copy of the charges against them, the notary, and an opportunity being heard. This is not on the exam but the hearing is called a tribunal hearing. Anytime somebody is accused of a conflict of interest they get a copy of the charges against them and then they get a notice for the hearing called the tribunal hearing and whatever they find in that hearing the notary's license can then be suspended or removed whether the notary did it on purpose or not if the notary did the conflict of interest knowingly then they're charged with professional misconduct because that's an intentional act misconduct is when you do something intentionally and that's a class A misdemeanor uh, when you do it by accident, your license can still be suspended or removed. And of course they can remove it when you do it on purpose. The three things that are legal to notarize, we already talked about. People's signatures to their own wills. Only a lawyer with a notary license can notarize a will to make it recordable and admissible. The, the logic behind that is that people need legal advice before their will is recorded so that they do it properly and uh, everything they're leaving for their loved ones, for example, will get to their loved ones. Number two, we can't marry people. We cannot notarize contracts of marriage. 
uh, and other states like Florida, a notary can marry people. Marriage is a contract in law before you go on to your priest, your rabbi, your reverend, your ashram, whatever your faith is. Uh, you cannot get married without a marriage contract. And in other states, <coughs> notaries marry people, even in Las Vegas. Number three, certified original certificates uh, on photocopies of government documents like birth certificates and passports. Um, hopefully uh, you've printed out a copy of your notary public license law. If you pause this video now and you go to page 21 of the notary public license law, you'll see on the bottom section of page 21 there's an explanation of certified original certificates and an example of what one looks like. And basically it's anything where the notary writes on a government photocopy of a government produced document, any words that say, I, a notary public, am making this document into a certified original, this photocopy, because I've compared this photocopy to what this person brought to me and purports or says is the original. So I compared this to what that person told me is an original. And now I'm making this photocopy a certified original. Well, we're not allowed to do that anymore. And I got to be honest, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore because what if somebody brings you a birth certificate from Kenya, from Mombasa, Kenya, that they say is the original and then they bring a photocopy on it and then they want you to certify that photocopy into a certified original. We used to have to do that. And now I'm glad because there aren't many people uh, in America that are, you know, would recognize a uh, Mombasa, Kenya birth certificate. So that's my point. We're no longer allowed to make certified original certificates on anything that's a photocopy of a government document. If you want to see what that looks like, an example of that, look at page 21 in the Notary Public License Law on the bottom section called uh, Certified Original Certificates. And there's an example of one there. It says you can't do anything like that. There's 11 fees in the notary public license law, which you have a copy of. And throughout that, uh, there are four questions on average in everybody's exam, which is a 40 question multiple choice exam that you need a 70% to pass, as you know. The first fee out of the 11 we're gonna cover is the application of $60 paid to the Secretary of State. This is after you pass your exam. You apply after you pass your exam. So your notary pri privileges do not begin until after you, you get your pass slip in the mail. With the pass slip will be the application, which includes an oath of office that you need to take and get notarized. You're gonna be sworn in for the first four years. Then they're gonna want your $60 to approve your application. You're gonna mail that up to Albany, a $60 check to the Secretary of State which is SOS, Secretary of State. Um, and that $60 fee goes to the Secretary of State um, to pay for your first four years, okay? Now, your pass slip that's gonna come in the mail with your application is good for two years. You have two years to use that pass slip. So don't be fooled on the exam. Your privileges for notary licensing or notary services do not begin until after you're approved by the Secretary of State, okay, the SOS, Secretary of State in Albany. Number two, reappointment every four years is $60 paid to the county clerk. So you'll notice uh, that the reappointment fee is four years later and that's paid to the county clerk, okay? You're not going to pay the Secretary of State any more fees for renewal. You'll be dealing locally with county clerks wherever you live or work every four years. Uh, there's something interesting here. I'll cover it later, but I'll mention it now for the uh, sake of redundancy repeating. That when the Secretary of State receives your $60, by the 10th day of the following month, they receive your application fee. They have to approve your application and mail down $20 out of that 60 to the county clerk. And then they're gonna notify that county clerk, hey, here's $20, make a new file, you have a new notary in your county. This is before you get your notification in the mail. 
Okay, now when you apply to be reappointed four years later, you're going to pay $60 to the county clerk. The county clerk needs to update the Secretary of State by the 10th day of the following month. And they're going to mail up $40 to the Secretary of State and say, hey, this guy in our county renewed, update your records. This guy got four more years and they're going to get $40. You'll see a pattern here where the Secretary of State always gets twice as much as the county. So in the case of application and reappointment, the county only gets 20 at each time and the state retains 40. We'll cover that again. Okay, signature authentication by a county clerk is a $3 fee paid to the county by a, by a person you just notarize something for. Okay, you just sign something and your signature is on something that you notarized. The person who needed the thing notarized is told with separate instructions that the notary doesn't even see to look at the notary stamp, also called the notary statement of authority, most commonly referred to as the notary stamp, which says the name of the notary's county. Remember the address on the license? That's the notary's county they're assigned to. That county clerk has the notary signature card. That county clerk will pull out that notary signature card when this person comes there and says, I don't know what this is, but I was told to get a signature authentication of the notary. And the county clerk charges that person $3 to perform that service. So where did they get that card? When the application was approved by the Secretary of State, they took $40 by the 10th day of the following month out of that 60 and they mailed it down to the county clerk and they said, oh, here is a new county, here is a new notary in your county and here is that signature card. So that's how they have that signature authentication uh, card. It's the actual signature that you signed when you took your oath on a card that you mailed to Albany with $60. Okay, So they'll compare the actual card that you signed. They have the one with the ink that you used. The Secretary of State does not keep a copy of the notary signature. They cannot authenticate signatures. Only the county clerk can authenticate signatures. The exam question is what's the fee for that? It's a three dollar fee and remember the notary doesn't even know this is going on. This is to verify that that's really the notary. Okay? It's to make sure there's no fraud. So only the person who the, who, who signature, whose document was notarized would pay that. Let's make that clear. Okay, official character verification by a county clerk is a $5 fee to look up a notary's license on the SOS, Secretary of State's website. Once again, when that application is approved by the Secretary of State, they mail $40 down to the county clerk by the 10th day of the following month with the signature card of the notary and the Secretary of State creates a database online that I'm going to do a video and show you uh, all about that. That's an online database that lists all the notaries in the state. That's what that is. They charge five dollars to look up on the internet that person's official character which is their license. It verifies that that notary stamp, the notary license which is on the notary statement of authority is valid. It, ver it verifies that it's a valid actual current notary license and that's a five dollar fee. So the exam question is what's the fee for official character verification? It's five dollars paid by, it's five dollars paid to a county clerk and they find it on the Secretary of State's website. Now since that's on the Secretary of State's website they could also do that if somebody came to a Secretary of State office and you might remember the Secretary of State always gets twice as much so official character verification at a Secretary of State's office would cost ten dollars because a county clerk got five and the state Secretary of State always gets twice as much so there's this ten dollar fee to perform that exact same service in their office at the Secretary of State's office Okay, to replace a lost, stolen, or damaged notary license, that's the, the card I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. That card is actually the, about the size of a business card or a social security card. During the four years, you would pay $10 to the Secretary of State. So it's a $10 fee 
paid to the Secretary of State during the four years if you want to get a new one to replace one that has been lost, stolen, or damaged. Notice that if it's lost, stolen, or damaged, that means you don't have it. I guess they don't want you to have two. Okay, but the only thing you need to know for the exam is if they ask uh, if it's been lost, stolen, or damaged, how much is the fee? It's $10, okay? paid to the Secretary of State. Or they could try to fool you and say uh, A, B, C, or D. Which of the following is not a, a condition where you can get a replace a notary license, okay? And if they said A, lost, B, stolen, C, damaged, or D, to get an extra one, the one where you can't do it is D, to get an extra one. Okay, to file your official character, or a license with additional county clerks, it's a $10 fee. Now, we already learned this morning that our jurisdiction is all of New York State. And we learned that when you're assigned to one county clerk where we're now, we just learned that your signature card will be kept, that you can still go to any, any county anywhere within the boundaries of New York State. Remember, we said you could go all the way up to the Canadian border, even from New York City, for example or the end of Long Island, and vice versa. So why would I need to file my official character or a license with additional county clerks? Because I'm already filed for the whole state with the, with the state, with the Secretary of State. And the reason I came up with for that is because when I first became a notary over 25 years ago, we had to do this to leave our county. Our jurisdiction used to be just our county that we were assigned to. And it's not anymore. So now the only reason we would do this is sometimes if you're a traveling uh, notary, for example, if you have uh, two offices you report to, maybe you report to one in one county, and then a few days out of the week you report to your company or uh, you know place of employment in another county. You split your time. You might, for the convenience of your clients, want to file your name in both counties so that they wouldn't have to go far away to another county to do things like verify your official character or authenticate your signature because that requires them to go to that county clerk's office. So the only reason I can come up with, which is not an exam question, why would you file your official character with additional county clerks? It might be for the convenience of your clients because our jurisdiction is now the whole state. doesn't matter what county's on our stamp. The only exam question should be you know, what's the fee to file your official character with additional county clerks? And the answer is $10. Okay? Fees continued. You know, there's 11. We're on the eighth one. Okay, a normal notary fee that we charge when we notarize for somebody is $2 for every original signature you witness. But it's not mandatory to charge the fee. In other words, for example, I have never in over 25 years ever charged anybody to notarize something. It's discretionary. It's up to you. And the exam answer is it's not mandatory to charge the fee. So when you notarize things, the normal fee is when you notarize something is $2 per, I like to say $2 per signature we notarize because, for example, if somebody asks you to notarize two originals because they wanted to keep one, and they wanted to mail one to the state, for example, that would be $4. Usually on every exam, they give an example of how many times you notarized something, and they say, what's the fee you're allowed? You're going to multiply that times two. So usually it's like uh, you notarize two things. What's the answer, A, B, C, or D? $2, $4, $6, or D, $8. The answer is going to be $4. If you notarize two things, every original one you notarize is a $2 fee. Okay, a protest for non-payment. There's a limit of five that can be that they can burden you with, and then 75 cents for the first one you do, and 10 cents for every additional one. This is kind of a really uh, a weird kind of a uh, fee. Uh, let's talk about what a protest for non-payment is first. And what's good is it's so strange on a multiple choice exam, it'll be easy to recognize. Okay, you'll see what I mean. So when somebody's protesting something for non-payment, it's just what it says. They weren't paid, 
So they want to file a paper in court to protest it. In other words, to start a, a collection. First, they're going to start an argument in court. It's called filing a protest for non-payment. So they put a limit of five of these that somebody can file at a time. I'm um, not file. I'm sorry. Bring to a notary to be notarized. Okay, and think of it like this: non-payment is collections. Nobody goes into business hoping someday that they can be in the collection business. They want their clients to pay their bills. So typically, they'll <clears throat> when clients stop paying their fees, they'll try to uh, avoid having to do collections. They'll throw it in a drawer somewhere and they'll let them build up, and then finally they'll sell it. They'll sell the debt to a collection company, usually for ten cents on the dollar. But anyway, so this collection company now has all these debts that they own. Maybe they have like 50 of these from this one company. And what happens if they bring 50 things for you to notarize at your office? I mean, think about it. When you get this notary license, when you, when you have a job, if you don't, you're not going to want to be notarizing for somebody you don't even know for like an hour. I mean, that will not be good for your employment. Your employer will not like that. So... I summarized that somebody probably complained when they brought too many of these in at a time to burden the notary. So they said, okay, from now on, you can only bring five of these at a time. So they won't burden you, okay? Does that make sense to you? Anyway, when they could bring more than five, the state had the fee lower when there was no limit. They said, well, if somebody could bring 50 of these in, we can't let them charge $2 a piece. That would be $100. That would cost too much for somebody. So we'll only allow the notary to charge 75 cents for the first one that they bring in. And then uh, for every other one, 10 cents for every additional one. Now the reason uh, I'm going to play a little game here with you to help you remember this, but you should protest that. So if they max out it, they bring five, they can only, the notary can only charge 75 cents for the first one, plus 10 cents for the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Remember there's only a limit of five. If you add that up, the notary only made a dollar fifteen. When 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 do I, when I only do one standard notary act, I can charge two dollars for just one. So you should protest that. Isn't that unfair? Doesn't it sound unfair? If you do five, you can't even make two dollars. So I'm just kidding around here. I'm trying to help you remember this weird fee. So there's a limit of five. It's seventy-five cents for the first one, plus ten cents for every additional one. It's a limit of five. Okay, the tenth one is the walk-in exam fee. It's $15 at the door. You should have read your frequently asked questions and you'll see the forms of payment you can bring in for that because it's a walk-in exam. Um, a little reminder here, lawyers and court clerks don't take the exam. Lawyers and court clerks already have a pass slip. They have a, a, a court clerk license because they passed their court clerk series of title exam. And lawyers have an attorney and counselor at law license, so they don't have to take this exam. They already have their pass slip. Okay, and then during the four years, name and address changes are $10. However, if you're changing your name for marriage purposes now in New York State, there's no fee to update the state. But during the four years, you want to keep the state uh, aware of where you live so that they can mail you. Uh, information or especially if you're a non-resident notary and you live in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or something or Connecticut uh, you want them to know where you live because remember a non-resident resident who only works in New York State cannot be served in their state Secretary of State will be served you'll still be served but the Secretary of State will receive it they'll have to mail it to you at your last address so especially non-resident notaries keep your address updated during the four years. You need to know if you've been served and you need to answer. Okay, that's the end of section two. Good job. Go ahead and take the quiz. I'm sure you'll do fine. And I'll see you back for section three.